Okay, well, firstly, I'd just like to welcome everybody uh, to uh, the panel discussion with um, our panelists here for business for future proofing your business. So thank you all for attending in the room. We've got a, uh, a great uh, audience here uh, live in um, the uh, office of Hall Chatterick. So thank you for providing the space. And um, for you, those of you who are attending online, thank you for attending. And uh, we hope you get some great value out of um, this afternoon's session. Um, we, uh, the format is uh, that we're gonna run for about 45 minutes in a panel discussion format. Um, I'll be asking a few questions and um, we have, I'll introduce our panelists here in a moment. And uh, we will have time afterwards for questions. Uh, we will draw some questions from online as well as from the room here. Now, if you do have questions throughout the session, um, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, Brooke will be manning uh, the, the chat and uh, we'll be communicating any questions once we do get to question time. Um, there will be two points uh, for your CPD record allocated. Uh, you will receive an email, so don't worry about that. Um, you'll get the code to put into your register after the event. And um, I'm going to run through... Um, we're going to break it into three main sections that we're going to be focusing on. Um, the, the first part is the now. Then we're going to also take a look at the near future with opportunities and challenges. And then we're going to look at the long term, what opportunities and challenges are um, uh, yeah, that are presented and uh, what businesses should be looking to do to future proof uh, for the year ahead. Um, so, without further ado, I'll introduce our panel guests. Um, we have uh, Mr. Blair Plish from Hall Chadwick. Thank you, Blair. Thanks for having us, John. We have uh, Mr. Ian Hyman from Hyman's Valuers. Good afternoon, John. We have Jeff Chisholm from Scopac. Thanks, John. And leading up the, the tale, we've got uh, Greg. Malone from G and H Financial. So thank you all for attending. All right. Now um, I'm going to start off. Um, I'm going to start off with. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Jeff. Um, Jeff, the question I want to ask is: What are we seeing in the market right now because of COVID, and more specifically, what has the impact of COVID been on businesses? And um, what, what are they saying? Yeah, thanks, John. And good to see a live audience too. Feel free to interact. But um, look, I think it's fair to say it's been a very challenging uh, last 18 months, probably more. Um, we've seen a lot of businesses that have been doing it really tough, um, reduced revenues, cash flow pressures. Um, but we've also seen some businesses that have been thriving, the likes of transport um, and food services. Um, for us, uh, funding requirements for working capital uh, probably hasn't been there where it has in the past, um, mainly due to government stimulus, um, businesses extending to ATO payment arrangements and, um, and things like that, landlords providing uh, rent relief. Um, but overall, um, it has been a, a challenging period. We, we produce a um, SME growth index where we go out to 1,250 uh, small businesses with revenue between a million and 20 million. And we ask various questions. It's all done by a third party. And we can get a good gauge on, on what they're saying. And um, some of the things that came out of that in the last one, which was September, is Two out of three businesses um, have sought um, new funding arrangements. Not surprisingly, eight out of uh, 10 businesses have had cash flow uh, difficulties over the last 12 months. And one of the key ones for me um, and everyone here today is that nine out of 10 businesses um, rely on a trusted advisor or have a trusted advisor now. Whereas back in 2017, four out of 10 uh, didn't 
have a trusted advisor. So when we talk about that, we're talking about everyone here today. We're all trusted advisors, and uh, and I think we'll all play a big part um, in businesses moving forward. Some big changes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, very quickly, um, if anyone at home would like to get a copy of the report, uh, just type in the chat, um, SME, or yes, please, and we'll, we'll make sure you get a copy of that. Um, okay, um, Blair, I want to ask you a question. Um, how has small business weathered the, the COVID period? Um, has there been any corresponding uptick in insolvency work? I suppose, John, I'll answer the first question first and then a brief answer to that is no. Um, in, in, the seven, in the figures maintained by ASIC uh, for the seven months to August this year, um, the insolvency, formal insolvency appointments were 18% down from last year. And last year was 44% down from the equivalent period um, in 2019. So there's a number of reasons for uh, why the uh, insolvency appointments falling off the cliff, so to speak. And that's obviously the, um, the main contributing factors are the range of government support, like JobKeeper, JobSaver, um, rent relief, and there's a myriad of others. And also ma uh, major financial institutions and the ATO adopting a minimalist approach to, um, approach to enforcement action. So at the end of the day, uh, on first blush, it might appear that uh, small businesses actually weather the COVID period extremely well. I think that's, yeah, in reality, I think that's probably uh, masking some, some significant issues uh, in terms of um, the, uh, I think there's probably a number of uh, businesses which have been hiding in the long tall grass, so to speak. Um, and there's probably a number of period, number of businesses which in the ordinary course of business have, would have had debt, would have entered the COVID period with debt levels, which they probably haven't done anything about. Um, and uh, they haven't been, they haven't really needed to do anything about um, in the last two years. So the support may be, may be changing things very soon. Yeah, well, we've, I think uh, anecdotally, we've noticed a little bit of an uptick since August, and obviously the figures aren't there for that, but um, they're, 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 uh, people may, coming into the COVID period, people in that subset may very well be needing to make some significant decisions with respect to their businesses. Yeah, fair comment. Okay, thank you, Blair. Um, we'll take it down to yourself, uh, Greg. Um, how and where do brokers and advisors see themselves working with clients to assist them in tackling the, the, the challenges coming out as we're coming out of COVID and moving um, towards future-proofing their business? Thanks for the question, John. Um, I think uh, you know, the basic narrative around funding for businesses has never changed. Banks um, generally take a longer time to work with customers. Um, principally, I think banks are looking for customers to know what they want, as opposed to opening up conversations or having the, you know, the conversation around what customers can do or what, or what products might be available. Um, so generally, if a business is going to a bank, they, they, have a, they have a product in mind and they'll present themselves with that. Um, long, long, longer lead times there as well. So brokers and advisors definitely play a very big part in this uh, curve coming out of COVID. Um, you know, professionals that you talk to every day all recognise that the growth curve is one of the biggest uh, risk factors here for businesses. So, you know, there's two sides to any business. The you know, fall off of business is bad. Um, but then also the growth curve can be equally harmful to a business in terms of how it supplements cash flow or how it pays for that growth. So advisors and, and in particular brokers in my space, I talk for myself and, and other brokers, but brokers will play a big part in that. Understanding what they can provide customers or what answers they can give or these sort of panel conversations are a big part of that. You know, bringing up industry leaders um, like Jeff, Ian, Blair, to talk about you know, what these customers are going to face, that's quite important. It's imperative to, for brokers to understand what these customers are going to want to talk about. Uh, under, un, understanding the products and how to put those to the customers as well. So you know, you've got a lot of different cash flow products. You've got short-term funds, you've got trade funds, you've got uh, you know, invoice factoring, you've got equipment finance, which is what we specialize in. So you can capital raise, but that may not be the ideal solution. So, 
a lot of factors there, and obviously very long conversations around how you can help a customer and which product's going to be the best one in that particular set of products. Yeah, so I think the bottom line is that businesses are really needing advice and someone to lean on. Uh, customers love conversations, but yeah, yeah, they, uh, they definitely need someone to talk to. They need a signing board. They need to be able to have a conversation with somebody that can not only object, but also offer a different alternative opinion to what where their mind is. In my experience with business owners, when they're going through a cash flow issue, you know, it's pretty stressful for them. So that, that, that decision-making process for them is actually harder. So yeah, yeah. I think advisors are a big part of that. Great. Thanks, Craig. All right, Ian. Um, Ian, with, with the opening of businesses and the increase in finance inquiries, which we're all seeing, um, can you identify the factors that a financier considers uh, when they decide if they'll fund different uh, types of equipment finance? I guess, uh, thanks, John. Um, critically uh, is, you know, one of the major factors is whether there's property security in place, um, in which case funders tend to be uh, not quite as um, particular about what they fund, uh, where there's no security and it's uh, you're lending against the asset, then, then fundamentally you have a number of factors that um, some funders, not all funders, will look at in the process of determining whether a particular asset is is, is appropriate. I mean, obviously you want an asset, um, you want to lend against assets that are readily saleable. So it's really important that um, uh, when you need to hit the market uh, with a distressed asset that it can be sold and sold reasonably quickly. And they don't have a significant cost in, in sort of uh, removing or deinstalling those assets and uh, you know, take them to another place or sale, whether it be a, a dealer or an auctioneer's yard. Um, those costs can be quite significant. And I think finally, um, in some cases, the, the funder actually takes on some make-good issues um, with certain types of asset classes. So it's also been, been or making uh, sure that when loans are, are being made against equipment that uh, you're not buying into sort of make-good issues that might occur at the back end when you need to recover those assets. Um, one area that's, uh, that's quite tricky for, for the major banks is on the sale and leaseback area. So one of the things that we work quite closely with Scott Pack on, for example, is on sale and leaseback transactions, which are a great way to sort of raise cash from existing from the existing balance sheet. And it's something that we, uh, we see increasingly now is a lot of businesses sitting there with equity uh, on the balance sheet in, the, in that area. Um, as you've no doubt, uh, read about and seen uh, in various newspaper articles, we have seen this uh, significant supply chain issue with new equipment coming to Australia and globally over the last 18 months. And what's, what that's generated is very high used equipment prices. So we are seeing some funders now requiring a deposit of 20 to 30% um, uh, on the purchase even of new equipment um, because prices have gone up substantially uh, or alternatively uh, on, on used equipment. And quite recently at an auction, um, we had a couple of the major banks uh, refuse um, leasing arrangements with customers that had master lease agreements where they believed that they'd paid too much for the assets, even though they, they were at auction. So, which I would have thought uh, the worst case would have been um, uh, a good indication of market value, but in, in one or two years time, it could be that those supply chain issues are, are resolved and, and therefore used equipment prices return to normal. We did see that pre the GFC and post the GFC similar situation where prices fell quite hard when the GFC hit. And, and I think people have got a reasonably good memory, uh, funders have got a really good memory of what happened there. Great, thanks Ian. All right, let's uh, move, move onwards a bit towards the near future now. So we wanna, I wanna take a look at what can we expect to see in the near future? Um, Blair, I'll start with you. Um, what do you see as the main challenges or pain points for small businesses as they, as they emerge again into the, the, the post-COVID period? And what should business owners be doing now? Yeah, I, I was trying not to be the, the naysayer on the panel, but I guess if the hat, hat fits, there'll be, um, look, there'll be a su subset of businesses out there which have had their revenues hit by way of lockdown and restrictions. There will be a subset, as I said earlier, of businesses which haven't really addressed uh, unsustainable levels of debt and haven't needed to through the COVID period. Um, but one of one of the um, one of the probably the un, unnoticeable, not, not 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 such an obvious sort of an out outcome of the COVID period has been the possibility of um, some businesses have done well, but there's a possibility of over trading mm -hmm. and uh, managing managing growth. I guess Ian uh, touched on it on it there. Um, 
there's obviously businesses that have uh, that have had, had to enter the secondary market and uh, they're buying equipment. They're pro they're probably the the value of the equipment that they're buying is probably unsustainable. There's probably and you know, there's a range of businesses which have been done significantly well during the, the COVID period, and you can name sectors like logistics, agriculture, um, civil engineering, and um, uh, construction. Some of those businesses would have done well anyway, um, particularly agriculture, uh, by way of uh, they've had they've had some great seasons. But um, other businesses have been have uh, been advantaged, so to speak, by way of the uh, some of the government policies. For instance, some of the government pro projects in the construction industry have been brought online to stimulate the economy. That's um, as I said. That's uh, obviously the supply chain issues have led to the uh, the equipment issue. There's other businesses which are obviously are entering, uh, having labour restrictions because or finding it difficult to find labour and having to pay over the, over the odds for labour because of the, um, uh, the a number of the restrictions around COVID that COVID's caused. And there's also, I suppose, we can even see here chat coming out of Queensland as we speak about um, uh, this, in particularly in the housing and construction industry, about the so-called profitless boom, mm -hmm. where uh, supply chain issues in the cost and uh, cost of materials is actually eroded and uh, shot, shot any margin that might have been, uh, uh, been able to achieve by, been able to be achieved by an increased volume of work. So, so I spoke- So what, what, let's move into the, the last part of the question. Um, what should business owners be doing now to, to finish with that? Um, well, I suppose the thing about it is, particularly with, that, with respect to that managing growth issue, um, two, two things is pro whilst we're supposedly living in unprecedented times, it is the fundamentals that need to be focused on. Yep. The fundamentals are obviously profitability, margins and cash flow. And I, with respect to that uh, subset of, that we're talking about, um, in terms of uh, the growth issue, they have to have the appropriate financing uh, lines in place to manage that growth. And the other thing is str be strategic about the concept that that growth may not be there in the next 12 to 24 months. Yep, fair comments. Thank you, uh, Blair. Um, Greg. In your opinion, can businesses confidently rely on the government SME loan scheme? Uh, yeah, there's a few reasons why I don't feel they, they can. Um, firstly, it expires on the 31st of December. So there's a very short runway to actually qualify or you know, to get an approval. If you get your application in, you've got a chance, but also the considerations or you know the, the, the factors that they are looking at when they're assessing these loans are quite challenging for a lot of businesses. They, they don't like to see COVID distress, which you know, naturally most businesses that are looking for this cash flow have or may have experienced some sort of COVID distress. That's, you know, that's, that's an obvious observation. I mean, so um, um, I think a lot of non-bank players like Scottish Pacific are gonna be a very big part or Scott back, sorry, man, I forgot you squashed the name. <laughs> like Scott Pack, um, you know, will, will obviously be a big, a major part of, of, of what customers can look to um, use to resolve their issues. But uh, the SME grant scheme, I don't think it's been a big, um, a big factor in, in certainly helping businesses work through this. And it won't be much, much use for much longer anyway. So, and you're saying it's a long process. It's a very long process. I mean, my customers that I've that I know that have been through it, um, you know, always surprised that the answer is no. Um, you know, they're looking at a, they won't tell you, but they're only looking at certain um, business sectors. They're not offering it to every business sector, um, so, which defies logic because it's an 80% government guarantee. But, you know, you've got to also ask yourself, what does that guarantee mean to the banks? Obviously not a lot. Um, yeah, so, so, so no conclusion there. Get some help. Conclusion is no. I don't, I don't have anything else to add other than that. Yeah. But no. Right. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Ian, back to you. Um, several businesses will most likely look to their balance sheets for funding. It's, I think it's an, an obvious one that we'll all be seeing. Uh, given that most loans are underwritten by some form of security, uh, as you mentioned, 
with that in mind, do all financial institutions use the same basis of valuation when determining the value on, on uh, especially used equipment? Do you want to go and say one thing? I wish. And if not, <laughs> I wish they used why one. not? Mate, we, we see, um, from time to time, we even see bases that we've never heard of um, from funders for, for valuations. Look, predominantly, um, as most people would be aware, we see market value, order liquidation value, forced liquidation value, market value, and continued use. Um, it really, uh, and Greg raised a good point with me prior to the discussion today, I've, I've always struggled to understand why, why some funders um, use certain bases of valuation because when things get tough and they do need to go and recover those assets, uh, they don't, um, um, if you like, sell the asset or try to sell the asset in the same manner in which they acquired it, which is on a market value basis, allowing to bring the asset back to marketable value, going through a, you know, a, an appropriate marketing campaign, which in some cases might be three to six months, um, and then obviously hopefully getting a sale away. So, and that's not practical. I'm not being critical of, of funders for that, um, for that uh, decision. But, but what it translates to is uh, basically prices that are uh, in distress situation generally well below the, the, the market-based valuations that were provided at the beginning of the contract. And there's often a reflection back to the, the valuer, if you like, and I'm a little bit defensive here um, about the fact that the, you know, the valuers may be perceived to have overvalued an asset. But the reality is that we're, we're valuing it on one basis and being asked to sell it on another basis. And it really sure. comes down to timing. So if you look at you know, um, the market value at the one end and force liquidation value on the other, we could be talking a timeline between you know, sort of three weeks and and, and 12 months. So nobody wants to wait 12 months to sell an asset, particularly if it's specialised or it's unique. Um, you want to get that money back as quickly as you can. And the reality is that I often think that we should be doing, as we do with, uh, with, with Scott Pack and others, more than one value so that they can actually see the differential between, say, a, a market value or liquidation value and their worst case, which is a forced liquidation value. But it can be confusing for, um, for customers, for, 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 for people seeking those funds, because they're looking at, uh, at maybe um, acquiring assets. Uh, they want to achieve, you know, obviously if it's coming from a dealer, there's a market price attached to the asset. Um, the dealer market price will normally include some warranty. They'll have, you know, the, the asset will have been um, uh, tarted up. It'll have a new coat of paint. They'll have uh, done all the basic um, mechanical inspections and, and, and generally repaired any of those uh, minor problems or even major problems that may present themselves. That's obviously going to generate a much higher price at a market value than it will for um, a private treaty sale between two independent parties, which is another definition of market value. So, you know, once that warranty has worked its way out, and often when a, a, com a company or business enters into a distressed sale scenario with its assets, you pass the warranty scenario. So you've lost that value in the first instance, it's gone. Um, and as we often see in those distressed scenarios, companies do not uh, also maintain their assets in accordance with OEM specifications. So that generates its own issues in the equipment is not in the condition uh, or similar to the condition that it was purchased in the first place. So lots of challenges um, for, for valuers, lots of challenges for funders in trying to you know, understand and bridge those, those um, uh, gaps, if you like, between the different definitions of value. Great. Thanks, Ian. Jeff, um, how can businesses be proactive and in the future proof? Well, I think the word proactive is key. Um, Got a, got a plan, plan ahead, have conversations early, speak to your bankers, um, ATO, your accountant. You talk about trusted advisors, work out your cash flows and use trusted advisors. Um, if you need funding to be put in place, speak to um, the trusted advisor. It might be Greg, your broker, who can look at different options there for you. Um, on the other side, there, uh, you know, you may have creditor and ATO pressure that needs to be taken care of, and um, you know, maybe you're not the one that should be speaking to the ATO. There are there are professionals that can do that, or look at restructuring the business, and in which case you'd talk to someone like Blair. So again, we we all talk about these trusted advisors. Um, we all have our different fields we specialise in, and I just think you know you've got to lean on them, but. But the key here is to really be proactive and plan ahead and have conversations early. You said anticipate growth. Can you say a bit more on that? Well, you've got to fund growth and, um, you know, you've, uh, it, it, it probably is quite difficult to anticipate growth at the moment, but um, you can't grow without cash and, um, and that really is the key. 
So know your numbers, act, act early. Great, okay. All right, so um, we're gonna now move into the long-term effects. So what do we think the long-term effects will look like? And I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Ian. Ian, for businesses relying on cash flow lending or, or some sort of balance sheet um, leverage moving forward, um, they'll lean on their business position. Considering this, what is the hidden cash cow and what does that mean for businesses? Look, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of companies, a lot of businesses out there at the moment sitting on equity in their balance sheet um, that have not not understood that there is there are there are avenues within the marketplace now that weren't there probably five years ago uh, to raise cash and to do that well in advance of having an issue. So if you're looking, if you're sitting down and doing your, your forward cash flows and budgets for the next 12 months and, and hopefully most businesses uh, do those, then in that process, they'd be looking at, you know, um, a possible... Um, you, know, uh, you know, negative growth or positive growth, depending on which way you're going, that additional cash is going to be needed. So rather than wait until you're in a position of distress to actually be planning now to get valuations done of equipment, actually raising that cash, even if it sits um, surplus for a period of time, because it's a lot easier to raise cash, uh, I know this sounds a bit trite, when you don't need it than it is when you desperately need it. And, okay. and turnaround times for approvals, uh, as, as most of you would know, uh, dealing with the major banks, those turnaround times are very, very long. When you work, move into the non-bank non lending sector, those times come down considerably. So you do get that flexibility on, on the asset side. And of course, the other, the other area, which obviously is probably the one that Jeff will be talking about is on the debt of finance side, where you know, so many businesses today still don't use their debtors um, as mm -hmm. part of their True. future cash flow projections. And instead of it being a millstone around their neck, waiting for, for customers to pay, particularly as you're growing, to have that, have that cash sitting and be able to draw on it and have a, that facility in place before you get into a distress situation. Yeah, I agree. And I can, uh, if I can add to that, um, the, having the funds ready, it may not be costing you to sit there uh, at the moment. There's so much flexibility available in the market today. Good. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, we're actually ahead of time, so you guys can relax. Um, Blair, back to you. I want to ask you this question. What is the role of the insolvency professional going forward? Does it need to adapt to remain relevant today? Well, um, as we're, we're hearing a bit of chat out of, um, out of the ATO that as we come out of the COVID period, they're going to be adopting an empathetic approach to ATO arrears, whatever that might mean. And they're going to have a different emphasis on um, on, uh, on on their collection policies than they they might have had pre-COVID. Now, uh, I guess sort of, it might sound a bit counterintuitive, but often when 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 there's a say an ATO demand or a demand or a, a nasty letter from a creditor in arrears, that can act like a canary in a coal mine, and it can be a catalyst for positive change. Now, um, without I guess, and that hasn't been and that hasn't been there for the last two years, I suppose, uh, in reality. And I guess that's the sort of, that's what the uh, message that we try, that uh, I'm, I'm getting myself out, out of today's uh, panel discussion is that uh, without that um, psychological emphasis, if you like, um, businesses, business owners and directors have to be proactive in dealing with uh, and taking ownership of uh, the restructuring any restructuring needs they might have um, uh, going forward through through the uh, throughout through coming out of the COVID period. Now, what I'd suggest uh, to deal with that is a call it a due diligence or strategic review. I'd probably call it a business um, or a spring clean of your business. And so, basically, that is the idea of focusing on some of the some of the challenges that you're going to face and that you're facing now in your business and where you and that where you want to be in 12 to 24 months time in the in in the medium term now that could be anything that could be it could be a whole range of issues um, it could be you know, managing growth refinancing and we've talk, discussed a lot of them today hmm. um, or it, it indeed could be addressing uh, uh, addressing arrears of debt so, so are you seeing a little bit of a move more towards pre-insolvency advisory? No, not necessarily. Um, and that prob 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 what, I, what I would say is 
um, when you say pre-insolvency, it's probably the insolvency profession as opposed to yeah. uh, uh, some of the other participants in that sort of sec sector in say in the past. So like, if I, I just interpret that you are you suggesting not enough people are reaching out before it's too late? Well, that that that, that has always been the case. Mm. Uh, but as I said, with that with a less less of an emphasis from the ATO, there's going to be a more 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 incent, more necessity for people to take ownership themselves. Yeah. Um, so. And like going forward, obviously, the, um, depending upon the nature of the challenge you, that you face, it obviously would require the use of trusted advisors and appointing poten potentially a team of trusted advisors to deal with the to a deal to a, to deal with the challenges, assist in that strategic review process and it, and its implementation. Um, so there's a range of. And recently, there's probably been a range of uh, restructuring options that have become available, which don't necessarily involve formal appointment. Sure. And I guess I think there's probably a role for the insolvency practitioner early on and earlier on in the corporate life life cycle in providing that An advisory that in that advisory piece. Yeah. yeah. So I think in uh, I guess in summary, from what I'm from what I from what I think is the best way way forward is for people that is for business owners and directors to be strategic and take ownership to future fit their businesses to take advantage of, or one to meet the challenges but there's undoubtedly going to be opportunities coming out of the COVID period as well like you said the, and, the they need to, and yep. the best to be able to be in the best position to exploit them uh the decisions probably have have to be start you have to start putting putting that planning in place now start early yep thank you Good answer. Okay. Greg. Um, Greg, for businesses looking past the COVID recovery and in, and in particular for businesses that are seeking out appropriate solutions for cash flow, what's the real price point difference between a working capital solution as opposed to a short term business loan, i.e. how much will customers save by using a true working cap capital facility versus a short term interest and principal style loan? If you got all that, yeah, I've got all that. Um, I want to answer that question in a couple of different ways. So, all from a few different perspectives. So, obviously, covering off the different products is quite an essential part of answering that question. Um, so, traditionally, what we do when we meet a customer who has a cash flow problem is we look to the receivables. So, we want to see what they've got in money owed, so debtors. Um, that's probably the quickest way of repairing cash flow, but there are alternatives as well. And then I'll enter into the, that part of the question that you've asked. Um, capital raising against equipment is a big one too. Um, you know, uh, fortunately for Australian businesses, they've got a lot of uh, equipment that's unencumbered, um, you know, and also with property now, the way it's going, although we don't specialize in property, you see property growth, customers can always lean on property for equity, which is a big part of why mortgage brokers are saying they're so busy, I assume. Um, but, you know, tr traditionally capital raising against equipment is what, what we look at, at as a second. And then, you know, you've got short-term debt solutions, which is what you're alluding to there in that question. Short-term debt solutions might be a quick capital fix um, for some, some business that's experiencing direct distress it may not always be the best solution because those are highly amortized payments, um, principal and interest. Um, some of them interest a little bit higher, but even if you're looking at the products as like for like, if the interest components are the same, if you've got a loan for 36 months, which is principal and interest, and that payment's about $2,200 over 36 months, whereas opposed to um, invoice factoring or um, debtor finance, whatever term you want to use or whichever product, um, you know, you're roughly paying for 100,000. That's the number, sorry. For 100,000, you're paying about 1,300 bucks or 1,500 bucks a month. So there's, a, there's an extra $800 on the table for cash flow, um, which can be quite essential to a business. You know, that's extra $800 worth of stock, probably translates to another 30 grand on the bottom line somewhere. So that's probably the easiest way to answer the question. Yep, and then the theme that is there again, cash flow. Just manage your cash flow. 
Yeah, well, cash flow facility is good too because it allows the business to not only use that um, or those invoices as a line of credit, so they get access to that money straight away. So if there's a million dollar debtor, for, uh, debtor ledger, for example, they can gain 800 grand to use inside the business. So the immediate working capital issues re resolved. Um, they can use that capital then to grow the business out of the facility if they don't want to rely on it permanently. Whereas um, generally that principal in interest product, that the payments are so highly amortized, they've got to pay the loan back so quickly that generally what they're doing is 12 months later, they're going back to draw down on that loan again. Mm. So they can never really address the issue. And they can act quickly. That's right. Um, you know, products like Scottish Pacific, you've got the ability of um, being able to read your ledger. Uh, they also help you manage that process so you've you've got some form of accountability in the process of when you're using the cash flow um you've got someone there that you can rely on for a conversation so if you if it's not working they'll be able to facilitate a way or means to make that product work where a short-term finance solution they'll lend you the money that they're very rarely going to lend you the money halfway through again so yep perfect and I, slightly and, um, different products um i believe you have a question you I, have like, a question. I believe you have a question you'd like to ask. I have a, of, I have a, I have a of, question for Jeff about his new, yeah. his new cash flow product. Um, so, Jeff, um, sorry to throw that I'll, in there. I'll articulate uh, the question better than that, but um, <laughs> maybe you can explain, Jeff, the interest only period that Scottish Pacific's offering for, or Scottpac's offering for the three month um, onboarding, or once the customer onboards, they get an interest free period there. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned before, first of all, great that you look at, um, receivables first when you're uh, assessing a client. I made that bit uh, up because you were here. <laughs> yeah, thought you may have. Um, yeah, so look, you mentioned before about the uh, government guarantees and uh, we have come up with something that we think um, will help businesses get on their feet. Um, it's an industry free period for the first three months um, of loans from 50 grand up to a million dollar limits for data finance and trade. Um, but yeah, look, it just gives them that opportunity to get on their feet um, over the next period while we're while we're coming, hopefully coming out of this um, situation. Yeah, and that makes quite, sense. Quite a big, quite a big saving too. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Um, look, that brings us to the end of our formal session. Um, thank you, guys. You got through. And um, so, in, in um, closing, I want to thank. Each of the panelists, I really appreciate your time uh, today in uh, providing your insights to, to the audience, both here and on, uh, on Zoom, and for the time that you contributed in, in the preparation. And um, everyone's put in a lot of, uh, of resources and effort to, to make this happen today. So thank you all and everybody that's involved um, uh, behind you as well. So I really appreciate uh, you uh, coming, um, coming um, today. Um, all right, so um, that brings us to the question time, guys. So um, we've had a few people here in the live in the audience. Um, I'll also get uh, Brooke, wherever she is, to check if there's any questions. Um, you can relay those over from online. So if you haven't yet put any questions online, um, do that now. We will have a look and see. Um, I just want to let everyone know. Uh, we do have a microphone here to, um, to bring around if you have a question live in the audience here. Um, it is a, a recording microphone. It's not a PA microphone, so you're not going to hear yourself through it. So uh, just remember, it is working. Okay, so we will bring that around if you have a question uh, to ask. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. They're... Um, they're ready for the for the difficult questions. <laughs> well, can, I, can I ask a question while we're preparing for questions? Yes. Just yeah. a, again, of Jeff, um, like your internal credit team, how do they see interest rates and credit availability over the next sort of twelve months to twenty four months? Do you do, is there a view that it will tighten or that rates will rise? A lot of talk about long uh, about long term fixed interest rates going up now. Um, what's what's your perspective? Look, I can't. On? To be honest, on the credit rates, I can't really give you a view on that. Um, what I can say is our credit appetite has been the same the whole way through right. and will continue. But uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the rates themselves, um, I can give you my view, but um, no, I think it's, um, yeah, look, I, I, 
we, we, we don't have a, have a position on that at the moment. You're keen to hear your view though, Ian. I know I've got some very different oh, views. I know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, look, no, I think, uh, I think um, we're going to see rate rises from mid to late next year. I just can't see, uh, you know, the, the amount of money printing that's gone on internationally. I think um, if this next uh, lot of tranche of funds uh, gets released in the US, another $2 trillion uh, worth of, uh, of funds into the general market um, with what's happening elsewhere around the world, um, inflation, the inflation journey is now definitely out of the bottle. And as we've seen, for those of us old enough, we've got a bit of grey hair. Um, we, we saw what inflation did back in the 70s uh, and into the 80s. Um, I have full expectation that it's going to be very hard to get that under control. And the only way to get inflation under control is to raise rates. Um, and raising rates, part of raising rates is also tightening credit. So those two things together, I think we'll start to see from the end of, towards the end of next year. And I think 2023 is going to be a very tough year for business. Yeah. And, if, and if for those of you online, if you have a question, have a, um, an, a view on that, love to hear your view. It's a very topical um uh, question that I think everybody's got on their mind. All right, we've got a question in the audience. Got one for Greg actually. So, mate, at Scottpack, we've seen a bit of an increase in um, the equipment finance inquiry. Um, firstly, are you seeing the same? And secondly, if so, um, what industries are featuring? Um, so, from my perspective, yeah, definitely asset, asset, asset demands up, um, but talking to other brokers and lenders, um, in the in the equipment space, probably about thirty percent growth. So there's definitely demand. Um, some of the aspects or you know the um, issues that people are dealing with there is supply and demand. Really, you know, de demand at the moment is higher than supply. And again, that's what Ian alluded to about the used prices going up for certain equipment. Um, so delivery times are blown out on new equipment. Um, but yeah, demand is up uh, sort of immediately after lockdown. Uh, well, straight after coming out of lockdown, you saw that growth curve in the in the equipment side. Um, what are you guys seeing? Xavier said be the same, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the microphone's moved on. Definitely live audience. Um, Ian, I've got a question for you. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, asset inflation and supply chain, um, and it was just touched on by Greg again there. I guess my question would be, a lot of business used the last two years to retool because they were incentivized by the government to do so with um, you know, different uh, depreciation allowances and so on and so forth. Uh, we all know, well, we, I assume we know that there is going to be a lull in uh, or a drop in the, the, the value of used assets. But given that so many businesses retooled with assets that have really long effective lives, whether they're yellow goods, agriculture, or even transport, do you think we're actually going to see a, a drop off on both new and used assets in the next three years, or should that sort of stabilise? Well, I think um, the instant asset write-off has obviously made a, a big difference to businesses um, acquiring new equipment. But I think, um, you know, more importantly, even than that sort of instant um, asset write-off is, is the fact that globally, um, in many cases, we're waiting one to two years for delivery of equipment. Part of this, as you no doubt be aware, is driven by the shortage of computer chips. Um, uh, I sit on the board of a, a not-for-profit company that manufactures circuit boards, and we're finding it extremely challenging to complete um, uh, boards that go into manufactured equipment, um, and that would be being, being felt by companies all over the world. So because we're increasingly relying on technology into those, into those areas, um, and there are now more and more chips being used in every piece of equipment, it takes years to uh, grow that capacity. And so we've probably got another two to three years, in my view, of strong prices until we see some sort of equilibrium um, in the supply and demand. I think what's happened with the instant, the instant asset write-off, we've probably seen that, that sort of, that get flushed through the system. Now everyone that wanted their new ute or their new bit of gear, they've, they've either got an order or they've purchased it. But I think um, it's really, it, we're part of this now, this global situation that we just can't avoid any longer. And uh, we've got once that two to three years and we get that equilibrium back, we are going to see a significant um, drop in my view in secondhand prices um, and availability times will come back significantly as, as it did pre and post the GFC. Very similar situation, but for different reasons. 
um, before the before the GFC and post the GFC, we saw 30-40% drops in, in equipment prices in the secondhand market between 2007 and 2008 9 in some in some areas, particularly in the mining sector. Correct. Thanks, uh, Ian. I do have a question from um, from online. Uh, the question comes from Tony Harmy. And Tony would like to ask, and this is directed um, to, to all of you, um, do you think SMEs use debtor finance enough to negotiate better trading terms with their suppliers? No. No? Well, that's good. Any advance on that? Absolutely not. They don't. Uh, I'd agree with Jeff there. They, they definitely don't. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. They don't, they don't see it as, an, as, a, as a position of strength. They don't, they don't see it for what it is. And I'll ask why. Is it because they don't know enough about their options or is it? Could, could well be. It's a great question. I mean, I think it's something that every business should be thinking about. And um, uh, we saw a business today that were getting significant discounts, supplier discounts through paying up front. Mm. And they were specifically talking to us about that. And uh, it was um, what you know, the discounts were way over and above what um, what we would charge. I think a lot of people are threatened with conversation or see a conversation as threatening. And, you know, a lot of businesses feel that they're lucky to have work where really it's not always that way. You know, it's, it's sometimes hard to find good supplies. So, um, mm -hmm. and in some ways, it's just a conversation. Just as a staff member would go to their boss and say hey i don't feel like i'm earning enough i mean you can sometimes go as a supplier and say look you know if or or to a provider if we're paying quicker yeah and would you say think that would you agree that sometimes i think maybe some businesses are a little bit intimidated to come and speak to an advisor in fear of maybe they're going to be commit themselves to something i mean i would imagine you're going to say what you need to say if a client can't do something you're going to tell them what are your thoughts on that greg no, 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 I think customers are very um, comfortable talking to advisors, but they've got to be careful about who they're taking advice from. Advisor is quite a broad term. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I suppose that's what all this uh, huff is about in the Royal Commission and all the other stuff that's followed on. Um, you know, where's the motivation coming from from the advisor um, is obviously a big component of what advice they're giving you. But customers seem to be very comfortable talking to advisors. They, you know, it, it makes more sense then than talking to a bank who's only got one product. So I speak to you know, the right advisor. Yeah, but you know, speak to two or three maybe in yeah. terms of when you're dealing with brokers. I often tell my clients to go, go and talk to somebody else. You know, it's, it's, there's no threat in it, and if they find a better product, that's great. It's, it's all part and parcel. Mm. Yeah. So I uh, think, John, there are a lot of great business coaches around now. There's a lot of guys at, at my age in their 60s that are, have run and owned businesses all their lives and have sold them mm -hmm. and been very successful and they're now out uh, in their declining years, passing on some of that experience um, and able to have, you know, very mature, rational conversations, Impartial. both both with the, obviously with the directors, but also, you know, with their suppliers and to bring them together and to actually find out how important, you know, um, you know speedier payments may be to them, but it's a, it's a real challenge. And yeah. having sat on a number of, of, of boards over the years, um, interestingly, um, everyone's worried about, you know, two things, price and not upsetting the, custom, not upsetting the customers um, and, uh, and their creditors. And, and fundamentally, um, if, you don't have the, if you don't ask the questions elsewhere, if you don't ask, you don't get. And in most cases that I've seen, people don't ask and therefore they don't get the benefit of that and turning it into a win-win situation. And I'm hearing, do you know your numbers, do the work, and yeah. know your numbers, know where you sit. Correct. Well, yeah. And I guess following on from what Ian's saying, there's been a, there's been a, uh, a move in the business community uh, towards advisory boards. Um, and you know, that's something that SMEs can look at even on an informal basis. And one of the, one of the big themes in, in, in advisory boards is to, re, as probably what Greg said, is to recycle that that uh, advice and depending upon the life cycle and to get um, get refreshed ideas through, through uh, or refreshed perspectives um, in, in your business as well or you from your advisors. Uh, I imagine you see people would volunteer for those boards with, with a great experience? Well, uh, there's some, I think there's some organisations that sort of uh, um, 
bring uh, bring bring bring, advi uh, bring advisory boards and and panelists to those advisory boards together. Great. Okay. Well, we have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, Robert. Uh, Blair, considering um, you know the people in this room uh, have a broad I or a, an idea regarding the right time to talk to an insolvency practitioner, given that there's 150 odd registered guests watching this from all range of different occupations, what are the trigger points? You know, and, and the easy ones, ATR is, but what are the trigger points that um, you know we should all be looking for when we're deciding at what point to introduce our clients to? to someone that does what you do, because it can be quite daunting for yeah. people that aren't familiar. That, that's right. I suppose the, uh, if you're, the thing about that is if you're even having that, those sorts of thoughts about financial distress, it's probably a worthwhile time to actually engage. And the sooner you do it, off leads to more results, leads to better results. Um, it's no good waiting until you can't pay the wages, um, because that's obviously going to lead to a lead to a dire result. Now, like, um, and the obvious, as you say, the obvious ones, if somebody's got yeah, unexpired, uh, unsatisfied winding up applications or stat demands against, it, against them, then there's every possibility that's a little bit too late. Um, you're going to see those sorts of, the difficulties are gonna be there. Um, if you've got any significant, for starters, you might not need the ATO on your back, but if you've got significant arrears of ATO debt that you can't pay or put through a payment arrangement, well, that's, that's a trigger point. It doesn't matter. You don't actually need the ATO to call you up and say, how about this? Um, and there's a lot of that going on. Like people, there are, there are folks out there who are saying they're busy now, but they haven't, but, oh, but I've still got the ATO debt and I haven't reduced it. Well, fundamentally your business is unprofitable. Uh, and I don't want to be negative there, but that is that that is not the rea that is that is the reality. If you're not paying all your debts, um, as and when they're full due, one there's a possibility you're insolvent, but two, fundamentally your, your business isn't profitable, and you need you don't necessarily as as we've all alluded to today, you don't necessarily need to funnel it down a formal appointment because there are other options. You know, unlocking it, unlocking the balance sheet, etc. In terms of uh, leveraging off what, what equity might be in your balance sheet. But the, you know, the, the, fundamentally there are a, are a lot of, war, there are warning signs beyond, beyond the obvious. You know, you've got, you're, not, you're not collecting your debts, your products, you've got, you're holding too much stock. These are sorts of issues. It might, might and, your, and your profits are going down. You, and that's, in the, that's not just now, that's in, a lot of these things, as I said, they basically are fundamental to running a business. You know, cash flow, it's trite, but it, cash flow is, cash is still king. Yeah, okay, so what I'm hearing on that too in conclusion is what I think what you're saying too is um, the cost of a formal, of formal action is, is severe. And if you act earlier, you can find solutions. I guess, you know, the old saying, if you, you don't know what you don't know, if you get that right advice early, costs can be a lot, lot lower um, to find appropriate action. Well, that's, that's correct. And like, it's a lot easier if there's a, if there's a core business there to core, a core business to say, there that's, there that's to save sort of business. Um, you know, obviously the cost of a formal appointment is expensive in terms of uh, uh, administ you know, the actual ex administrator's costs. Yes. And it's also uh, expensive to, um, in terms of the goodwill to your business. And, and it's your hence options. why everybody's trying, hence why everybody tries to avoid it at all, all, all costs. But it's just, as I said, there's probably a lot more benefit in engaging in that um, discussion with the insolvency, within the insolvency practitioner at a lot earlier stage in the life cycle. Because there is, an accountant has the obvious thing of let's put it on a payment plan. That doesn't address the fundament, fundamental issue in the business which led to the arrears in the first place. And you know, that, has to be, that has to be drilled into. Um, and you know, business, business, and it's a difficult, difficult thing, but businesses have to psychologically get over that hump. And a quick fix is not always the best fix. The other thing there, Blair, is um, engagement doesn't mean commitment. 
So engaging with a practitioner doesn't mean that you're committed to the process, but you do get to hear the options. And um, there are some fantastic outcomes through, through either the VA process or the new uh, small business restructuring process um, that practitioners can bring to the table. And, uh, and I think there's, there's, a great, there's a better chance today of turning business around and saving them than probably we've seen for a very long time. And there's a preparedness because of COVID and, and an understanding by large businesses as to what smaller businesses have gone through in particular, mm. where they are prepared to compromise. So there is opportunities to compromise debt. There's co opportunities to um, you know, take hard decisions about whether it be uh, terminating leases on premises, terminating staff that are no longer contributing to the business because the business direction has changed. All those sorts of things can be done through an administration. And whilst obviously it's, it's not great for your brand to go through that process, uh, it often means that you can come out of it um, with a good practitioner behind you. Um, um, with a business that's stronger and, and, and more sustainable than it was uh, right. prior to going through that process. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good, uh, good advice. All right, we've got a few more minutes and about for one more question. If we have one last question in the audience before we wind up, so there's about, about four minutes left. I think, I think we can wind I think up. we're... Uh... <laughs> I don't think, I think everyone's... I think we're, we've uh, got to the end. All right, so looking closing, thank you all for attending. We really appreciate you guys um, uh, live here, taking the time to come and join us. Um, help yourself to some more refreshments uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, thank you all for attending online. Um, we really appreciate you um, taking the time out. And uh, if you do have any um, final questions, feel free to put them through and we will make sure that the panelists will come back to you with some answers. Um, hope everyone has a lovely night and uh, enjoy. Thank you for joining us.